Hey guys, welcome back to the Vince Salerno Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Vince Salerno. This is episode 69, and this is a special one, because I have a very special guest on this episode for you guys. It is uh, my good friend, Helen Roy. For those of you who don't know who Helen is, uh, she is a contributing editor at The American Mind. She is the host of Girl Boss Interrupted, the podcast, and she is a fellow at the Claremont Institute for Political Philosophy. Helen typically writes about women's issues, family formation, and the revival of old philosophies to address modern problems. But she'll tell you that the most important role she has these days is being a mother. Now, this episode is titled, Did the Girl Boss Ruin Hollywood?, and it's funny, usually going into these episodes, I have a plan, I have a list of topics that I discuss with the guests or just with myself if it's just me, um, and we usually stick to that plan. We don't usually go off the beaten path, but this time, like mid-recording, I decided to just throw out the script um, outside of our main topic because we had just a really natural conversation about culture, about uh, feminism, about the state of Hollywood. Um, it was really great to get Helen's perspective on a lot of these things. Um, you know, she says in the show that she's not well-versed in film culture. She likes films and she watches films and she likes talking about it, but she's not as, uh, you know, well-versed into like modern films and the state of modern cinema. Um, but she had a lot of really interesting things to say, which, led to, I think, far, a far more interesting conversation than what I had planned. So if you kind of see me, like, changing course in during parts of this episode, that that's why. So when we started recording, we did record an intro, but there were some pronunciations in there that no matter how hard I tried, I kind of botched, and I'd prefer you guys not see that. <laughs> So if we're talking in the beginning about um, intros and pronunciations and you're confused, that's why. Uh, again, just to reiterate, um, this was a fantastic conversation with Helen. She um, she just really elevated the conversation to a place I didn't uh, uh, I don't think do it a place where I don't think we've ever uh, had conversations like before on this show. So. I'm really grateful that she was able to be on the show. Again, check out Girl Boss Interrupted, the podcast. I say that in the show already, but it's a fantastic show. If you're not well-versed in um, women's issues like I am, <laughs> it's a great show to um, um, get an insight on t into uh, that world. Um, again, thank you guys for, for watching. I hope you enjoy this, uh, this episode with Helen Roy. And I'll see you next time. God bless and peace out. It is my pleasure to welcome for the first time ever on the Vince Loyal Podcast, Helen Roy. Thank you for having me, Vince. Thanks for being That's, here. Such, I hate biographies so much. Or biographies yeah, that was, is not the right word. That, I guess that was it is a tough the right one. Word. I need to brush yeah, up on my a, Polish. <laughs> I know. But you I know. are such an accomplished individual. That's why it's such an honor to have you uh, here on the show. Well, thanks. Uh, is there anything you want people to know about you that we did cover in that? <laughs> uh, honestly, everything in my bio is all the stuff that is not important at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the only thing that matters to me at this point in my life is my kids. <laughs> so, mm. yeah, that, maybe that's important to know. I'm a mom. And, uh, yeah, that's it. I'm a mom. I'm a Catholic. <laughs> I'm a Southerner. <laughs> <laughs> Catholics unite. <laughs> so uh, I'm sure I'm sure your audience that are that are checking this out, and even some of my audience are probably thinking, um, "What's Helen Roy doing on a podcast about movies?" <laughs> yes, <laughs> but um, you actually have some some uh, I think personally interesting takes on on film and Hollywood. Thank you. Maybe so, we'll see. <laughs> well, I guess we'll see. And 
Yeah. No, I really enjoy film. I've always really, Mm -hmm. really enjoyed film. Um, And uh, I've I've been disappointed by by the culture war stuff that that we're always talking about. Um, Mm -hmm. But I think that film uh, film is a really important tool um, and it can be, you know, a lot of people, especially moms, actually, because, you know, we're always worried about screen time or whatever. Um, I think we get we tend to focus too much on 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 the, the medium itself being like bad or something. And mm-hmm. I don't think that's true at all. I think it's just it's it's a tool like any other tool or technology that can be used for good or evil. Um, and when it's good, it's really, really good. Yeah. No, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, the medium is being used uh, for sinister purposes. Uh, mm-hmm. And you've seen that with the fall of a lot of once great film studios. And now a lot of people are having to turn to alternatives. And um, a lot of people have been saying, like, you know, you have to speak with your wallet. And I don't think people have really gotten that until like the past two years where you see very few. It feels like every year there was a billion dollar box or two two like billion dollar box office hits and now it's very rare that you'll even get one yeah so interesting mm-hmm. i mean and do you think that part of that was the whole covid thing or do you think it's more because you know what what is an opening weekend anymore like the platforms have changed so much so many things just mm-hmm. go direct to streaming um yeah i guess it's yeah. a combination of a lot of things isn't it I think COVID had a, a, a an effect and it had a maybe a lingering mm-hmm. effect, but I think that got, I think nowadays anybody who uses the COVID excuse to say that, oh, that's why box office numbers aren't as great anymore. I, I, I don't think that that's a, a, such a strong argument anymore because clearly the pandemic's been over for a lot of people, not everybody, but especially not the government, but the pandemic's been over for a while and people have been going back to the movies as seen with um I, I, what I, what I, and many others consider to be like the, I guess, like the trilogy of um, non woke heavy hitters over the past two or three years is Top Gun, um, mm. Super Mario Bros., and Spider Man No Way Home. Th- those movies prove that if you make a really good movie and you please the fans and you and you please your audience, COVID or not, people are going to go and they're going to give you a billion dollars in return. Mm. Yeah, Top Gun really um, seemed to have an impact. Every every mm-hmm. boomer I spoke to about that movie was just completely like, it's the best movie I've seen in 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. that, And it's almost, uh, it's part of it's the um, Tom Cruise effect. I mean, he has such a, <laughs> a dedication to the craft, but also a respect for the audience. Um, it's probably what's going to make the next uh, Mission Impossible movie coming out this year uh, a big hit. My my wife is, I, I joke, she is like the biggest Top Gun fan I know. And she didn't even necessarily like the first movie. <laughs> That's funny. She, she yeah, yeah, she was like, when are we going to watch it? We haven't watched it. We didn't watch it for the one year anniversary. When are we going to watch it again? It's like, <laughs> all right, calm down. <laughs> I mean, me being a big fanboy of almost every big popular franchise, it's like... I, I, I put my, I see her like in my shoes, like, all right, I see what you have to deal with on a regular basis. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, well, my husband, a box office. A movie buff and I am, he's like, he grew he was like the young, well, he's a middle-ish child, but the youngest mm-hmm. boy and, and, and six. So he's number four and um, just grew up watching a lot of, and he's he's a millennial, but uh, he grew up watching a lot of what his like Gen X um, brothers were into, and so he really mm. is like he has such a, a deep knowledge of like all of these '80s movies, and like really oh, yeah. like one of the the peak of 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 a certain kind of American culture. <laughs> oh yeah, um, yeah, I definitely agree with that. I uh, I'd say most of my mov- my favorite films are are from the '80s. Yeah, I was gonna go Star into. Wars. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, yeah. Um, I was gonna go. In, I was gonna jump into our box office discussion, but um, since you mentioned it, um, I think I, I think I know the answer. But I'm curious, what is your favorite movie? Oh my gosh, that's a great question. 
what is my favorite movie? Probably the 2001 or 2002 version of The Count of Monte Cristo. Okay, not King. what I was expecting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a really good one. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's a great movie. I thought you were going to say Girl Interrupted. Oh, ha <laughs> ha. No, actually, I hate that movie. I mean, I like it in oh, the sense that okay. it's intellectually like stimulating, but it makes me so uncomfortable and upset. I don't like mm -hmm. it. You know, I yeah. don't like to watch, enjoy watching that movie. It's right. just, it's, it says something that I think is profound for the moment and for, you know, women's history in America. But, um, but no, I do not enjoy it. It's not a happy point that it's making. <laughs> Right. Well, I, I think it was because I think you said that the name of your podcast was kind of a riff on that. I, I, I guess I it just was. assumed like, yeah. oh, yeah. But yeah, um, I, I find that hilarious. I find it hilarious that that move because um, the movie is directed by one of my favorite filmmakers, James Mangold. He's directed a lot of my favorite movies oh. like um, 310 to Yuma. Logan, he's directing the next Indiana Jones movie. And then to hear like, oh, yeah, he directed a movie about uh uh, women in like a mental mental institute going crazy, and it's like, wow, yeah, that yeah. is not what I expect from a uh, from James Mansfield. <laughs> I love Three Ten to Yuma too. Oh yeah, such a such a great movie. He he's like one of those few filmmakers that like invokes old Hollywood and and, and like classic heroism, combating good and evil, and and uh, and uh, yeah. the idea of like aging heroes. Um, I don't know, very, very attractive for a, for a masculine audience. Um, yeah. But yeah, speaking of box office, let's talk about, um, I guess let's talk about the year so far, as far as movies go, and then just the box office alongside that. I know you said you haven't really been seeing a lot of movies this year, paying attention to mm -hmm. that, but uh, then again, neither have I. I, I I'm actually kind of surprised. What's that? What did you say? No, I was just saying, I said, I'll, I'll have to comment in ignorance. It's, you know. <laughs> no, it's all good. It's all good. Doing. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Yeah. I'm actually kind of surprised at the number of movies that I, I haven't seen. Because usually, like, amongst my peers and stuff, it's like, a, oh, my gosh, how many, how many 2022, 2023 movies can we see, you know, in the year? It's like, it's like Pokemon. We got to catch them all. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, when you I'm a kid, it really changes your calculus, I think. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I, I think yeah. as you get older, you start to realize like, you know what, there's more important things than seeing every single movie that comes out. Yeah. <laughs> Especially yeah. when there's a better chance that half of them are going to be horrible. Yeah. I mean, that really, that really, if I'm being honest, like that, that's the issue for me. I can't yeah. watch anything that is, is basically, that was basically created after 2010. And even that is a bit of a stretch. Um, what I'm curious, what movies that you're aware of have come out this year that you've that you've either avoided because you know reasons or because or that you've seen and you've enjoyed or disliked oh my gosh that's a great question vince i'm totally ignorant i have tuned it out i have no <laughs> idea i mean okay like like i said like this could be because I have a two and a half year old, a one year old, and another baby coming in eight weeks. You know, it could be. It could be <laughs> you a you obviously have that. more important things to deal with in your life. I understand yes, that. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm more focused on like I don't know, getting through the day. <laughs> but but also I I really but I, I do think that if I um because my husband and I will like you know at the end of the night like cuddle and watch something that we like, um but. So it's not that we're not consuming media at all. And I think that if there were really good things out there, we'd, I'd be happy to, to consume it and, and, you know, I'd be interested in that. But I just, nothing, there's just, I, I don't know what has come out this year. You tell me <laughs> and I'll let you know. Okay. Fair enough. Well, actually, okay, on that note, um, what streaming things have you guys been been watching together? It doesn't have to be this year. I'm curious. Well, this is so embarrassing, but we just watched The Office. We like that, I love that's I've, not I've embarrassing at all. Yeah, yeah, we just I just old episodes of We're The We're the Office. same way. We it's like my wife's yeah. favorite show. We watch it on repeat all the time. 
You know, we, we so... literally just finished it last week, and then when we ju- we restarted it this week. I okay, so I love The Office, and I really love Thirty Rock. I think Thirty Rock, and I saw this in a tweet one time, and it was like, oh, that's so true. It's like, um, it's like it, it, it's a conservative show with liberal aesthetics. So yes, it's like in New York and all of this stuff, but like all of the characters that you love the most are like. <laughs> conservative and like the the not not just the characters but like the 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 implicit sort of lessons you're learning are are like that the the new york thing is kind of degenerate Mm. i love 30 that's probably like my favorite show of all time um and i really like the office too because it really this was like they were doing this and like lambasting the corporate culture and like the diversity training and the the like girl boss like nonsense <laughs> like jan if you think about jan you know they were yeah. really like turning those cliches on their heads bef- in a in a way that like it doesn't even seem like it would be possible now mm-hmm. you know like some uh, of the yeah. things like when when michael when they have the they have the merger and there's a black guy who was in prison <laughs> he's like and then he does the prison mic thing to convince everybody <laughs> that you know Scr- the scranton office is better than prison <laughs> it's like, right oh my god it's so funny but you couldn't do that today that's like a violation of something you know yeah like, nobody can laugh anymore it's, it's like the ultimate hypocrisy of hollywood they want you to like, yeah, buy a subscription to Peacock and consume The Office on a daily basis. But they don't want you to laugh <laughs> or they don't want to. They can't. Yeah. They, I mean, like, I, 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 I get so scared of the thought of doing like a reboot of The Office or or actually, I think they announced oh. that. I don't I, don't, I, I heard this. I they did. They just want. To. Yeah. Isn't like a like a female led uh, remake in Australia, whether it's it's like it's like covid yes. or they're working from home or something oh is that it i didn't realize that I, was I think so i it, it was like a passing thing i didn't even think it was real but apparently it is so yeah i it, had heard that they were doing a female like a female michael scott figure mm-hmm. which just is not going to work it's just not going mm-hmm. to work yeah it was a different show for a different time i'll have to check out 30 rock um Actually, my my favorite like comedy show in that realm has to be Parks and Rec because I feel like sometimes The Office can get really like there are some really depressing moments in The Office, and you know yeah. I'm, I'm a more upbeat person, so um, mm-hmm. I feel like Parks and Rec has a, a more like optimistic slant to it. Yeah, that's true. But it, it, you know, it's it's the same digestible nature of of The Office and shows like Thirty Rock. Um, but no, no need to be embarrassed at all. I, I think it's actually very normal. Like, I, I feel like it's, if you're not watching The Office on a regular basis, you're not normal. Yeah. <laughs> Gotta be something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, well, yeah, so I, I guess I'll go through what I've seen this year and what I've actively avoided as well. <laughs> I think first off, obviously, I've been very vocal about this. I've been avoiding almost every live action Disney remake um, especially uh, the Little Mermaid that just came out. Um, it's so personally offensive to me as a redhead. To have been yes. Replaced. Okay. I I wanted to bring this up. How do you <laughs> feel about the the uh, the cancelization of gingers and redheads in Hollywood? Literally, like, why is it? I mean, why? why it's always redheads. Mary Jane and Spider Man was a redhead too. You know. Yeah. And. Listen, I don't have a problem with Zendaya or this other um, black girl who are both beautiful women, but if we're if we're gonna be so fixated on representation or whatever, like I I don't know. Here's the thing: I I feel like um, it's actually insulting to black people to uh, have them just be like these like sort of fungible characters in stories that they themselves would say are like not not for us or whatever. Um, like, mm-hmm. I think that's why Black Panther was actually so powerful for so many people was because it was, it was 
um, you know, it was it was a story that that was kind of that was not pandering in that way. It was like, well, I mean, you could say that it pandered in in, in several different ways, but but it wasn't this sort of like replacement of like we're just going to include a token black person for the sake of it um, to make you happy and to to let you know that we're doing diversity. It's like, well, what about mm-hmm. what about creating new stories uh, or or better stories or stories you know about about the black experience? Um, because we, you know, if that's important to you, then let it be important to you. I just don't understand why we have to rewrite all of the stories that have already occurred in this new lens that's just totally improper to the story itself, especially mm-hmm. when it comes to fairy tales, actually, because there's just no place for the racial, the modern racial narrative element in ancient like Grimm's brothers fairy tales it makes no sense it's totally Mm -hmm. it it completely it's it completely it's not just it's it's really gosh what's the word that I'm looking for it's just condescending like if I were Mm -hmm. black I think I would be upset by it that it's like really anyway I think there are Um, a lot of black people who do agree with that opinion that are are upset by this and no I, I completely agree with you I think um yeah Black Panther was um, I mean, a lot of people, I feel like in the conservative space, kind of poo-poo Black Panther. But I do think when I saw it, I, I was actually wowed by the movie. I I, I thought it was a great story of um, nobility and doing the right thing. And um, it was almost inconsequential that the characters were Black, which I think should be the case for any any film that is not explicitly talking about race. But the movie, yeah, it was a great a moment for uh, representation, I think, because yeah, it, it wasn't about race swapping anybody. It was about telling us an original story about a character that has been in the comics for a while that, um, you know, wanted, wanted their black people clamored for that movie because they could see themselves in the character. Um, yeah. and, and I do think that most of the elements too. say that um, again, there Sorry. Was, it had distinctly sort of African, like cultural elements Right, um, right. And and I think that that's good. I think people should be allowed to celebrate their own history. And I think it's sort of like, it's a weirdly like insecure thing to try to insert yourself into somebody else's, you know? Mm-hmm. Like I feel the yeah. same thing about, about Bridgerton and all of these things that are coming out and that they're in, oh my goodness, and the Lord of the Rings and all of it. It's like, well, I mean, especially, this is just, I mean, come on, like European royal history. Let's be real mm-hmm. about what those people looked like. It doesn't add anything to the story to, to, you know, blackwash or whatever. And the that's the, really the peak of the irony of this whole situation is that the whole complaint and the whole conceit about Hollywood, Hollywood Oscars so white or whatever, is that we, mm-hmm. that is that Hollywood has like whitewashed stories by you know inserting white people where they don't belong like there's that one movie with george clooney and um emma stone gosh i read the book and i never actually saw the movie but it was a very oh, popular um movie in hawaii took place in hawaii oh is it um uh aloha or i think was it so- something like that maybe i think that i think you right. might be yeah. confusing two different movies because george Am clooney I- was in the descendants the Descendants, um, that that's what was I'm in Hawaii. About. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. Was Emma Stone in yeah. that one? Yeah, I think Emma Stone was in it, and there was there was oh. controversy because in the book she was ethnically Hawaiian, and then this, oh. you know, white girl. Um, I'm trying and to. Am I right about that? You can totally fact check that. That's fine. And honestly, I'm okay with that. Like, be 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 accurate to the history, to the book, whatever. Whoever that person was let it be who that person is, you know, but um, yeah. that has to apply. That has, that principle kind of has to apply all the time. Um, oh, oh yeah. Okay. So it was, it was, a, about that? it was Aloha with Bradley Cooper, Emma Stone, Rachel McAdams. Um, I, I know the on... was the book that I'm talking about though. Hmm. 
Who was the female in, in the descendants? Well, Aloha has the whitewashing controversy. Oh, I see. Then I could be mixing yeah, it up. Because the descendants is um that was Shailene Woodley and George Clooney. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I I, yeah, I just, no, I the only reason I remember that is because um, I'm originally from Nebraska and the guy who directed that is from Nebraska. He's like a, it's like one of the unsung heroes uh, locally okay. as a filmmaker. So oh, well, I was trying, because nice. I almost got those mixed up too. Um, yeah. But yeah. And uh, not at the same time as well, but. Right, right. Regardless, yeah. you, you understand what I'm saying. Like I do, I yeah. Think a sort of schizophrenic attitude toward um you know race and movies and it's just not a healthy one mm -hmm. yeah I, I think i think you're right if we focused on if hollywood focused on stories about different ethnicities different cultures different skin colors i think it's the most i think it's the least interesting thing about people but if you want to focus on skin color fine but tell original stories and don't put anybody else down in the process. Like, I feel like the last Black Panther movie, uh, I never saw it, but apparently there was a lot of, um, you know, more of the same from the last movie. But a lot of people said like, oh, there, there's like several scenes where they deliberately go out of their way to put down white people. And it's like, why? Why do we need to do that? Why Why can't we let movies exist? And Because and I feel like that makes the racism argument like even more prevalent. I, I always uh, show people that uh, Morgan Freeman clip uh, of him talking about um, Black History Month. And then it's like, I don't, I don't want a Black History Month. And he's like, well, how are we gonna mm -hmm. fight racism if we don't talk about Black history? It's like, we'll stop talking about racism and it goes away. And I completely agree. If we stop talking about racism and top, stop acting like every single person who has, you know, pale skin is, is a racist just f simply based on their existence we won't have right. this issue it's 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 a it's a uh it's a false issue i think yeah yeah so anyways, it's, we... it's, it's and it's really created this extremely chilling effect in people's personal lives people feel like they can't just openly say what they think and mm -hmm. also I think it's created a real chilling effect in writers' rooms where people feel compelled to write things that they may or may not think, but they know it's the the, the politically correct thing to say. And it just makes movies so bad. Like Yeah. You know, like that's the difference. Like okay, there's I guess there's a how do you distinguish propaganda from art? This is, you know, a fun question <laughs> that every 10th grade English class loves to talk about. But I think ultimately, <laughs> one of the best judgments you can have is just your aesthetic sense. And, um, you know, it's propaganda if it's like really just terrible, if it's just really bad. If it's, mm -hmm. you know, you just tell something's like hand fisted, ham fisted, awkward. Yeah. You feel like unsettled to a certain yeah. degree while right. watching it's the like, movie. It's, you're not talking, they're not writing about the human experience. They're not writing. They're not capturing truth. Um, mm -hmm. I think people can feel that in their bones and it, and it comes out as ugliness really. Yeah. Yeah. I, I completely agree. And I think that's definitely the case with the, I, again, I never saw little mermaid, but from what, people told me just what I was seeing in clips and trailers it looked all these remakes they look heavily uninspired uh like bland CGI gobbledygook um I'm wondering how the CGI has gotten worse over time I, I think it's actually because people use it too much I think um in, in my personal opinion if you rely on it as a crutch to create the world you're trying to tell a story in it's not going to look good if you use it to elevate um and this is like technical jargon if you use it to elevate practical um elements around you then it's actually going to probably come off a little better because it's being integrated um with real elements like the last couple marvel movies and even even this little mermaid film just look 
awful. And you br- you put yeah. that up against movies from like ten years ago that were on like the the, the cusp of CGI, like that that first Iron Man movie. Uh, it looks like real armor. And now you look at uh, like the costumes and the CGI and mar- modern Marvel movies, and you just you can tell something in your brain just says that's not real, and it just takes you out of the movie. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Among among the uh, many problems that exist in in Marvel and and Disney and and all the, I mean, you kind of hinted that you. What, what's your take on on like Disney, Pixar, Marvel, uh, the whole Disney library, basically like yeah. in the pits right now. <laughs> Man, um, I uh, I really liked Pixar films, and I thought that they were so well done for so long. Um, I think Up is one of the best animated films, probably the best animated film ever made. Um, It's so sweet. And that first vignette is just amazingly well done. Mm -hmm. Um, Gosh, I think Monsters, Inc. is a really good movie. I think I, for a while, I was really into Pixar theory, you know? Like, oh, it was just yes. like a, one rabbit hole. <laughs> Gotta the love the Pix- I love the Pixar theory. Isn't it so fun? But I love how all those creators kind of stuck around and they put little Easter eggs in all the different movies. And mm-hmm. that's fun. That's fun to sort of hunt down. I like that. Oh, um, yeah. I think the first time Pixar jumped the shark um, would have been Brave because they were they they were doing a sort of you know edgy uh twist on 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 the classic fairy tale and Mm -hmm. um trying and you know i'm not as upset about the storyline as as some people are because i think that there are good stories to tell about the relationships between mothers and daughters Mm -hmm. um it's it's yeah i really like brave it, it's yeah, a movie yeah, that yeah. comes up in a lot of circles that people are like, oh, Brave is like the worst Pixar movie ever. I'm like, what the heck are you talking about? I mean, yeah, I don't no, particularly exactly. relate to the main character, but I thought, it, I, like you said, I, I think it's a great mother-daughter story. And I mean, now you can say there's like a thousand of them, but it came out at a time when I don't think there were that many. Yeah, that's true. And I I guess um, if, if I have a qualm with Brave, it's not necessarily the story itself, but the... Um, it's the fact that they were mm, they were dipping their toe in subversive waters, if that makes sense. It was a, it was sort mm. of a canary line situation. I can uh, see that. What, what was going to come with Pixar. Their sort of creative direction was taking a new turn. And so, mm-hmm. you know, on its face, it's not like super offensive or anything, but it it was a sort of hint about where they were going to go. Um, it was almost before it became an in- intentional hill that disney as a whole was willing to die on yeah yeah which is just being subversive that's the hill they just want they want mm-hmm. just want to subvert every story and um you know it's not cute anymore <laughs> it's, it's really not cute um to mm-hmm. because because there's deep knowledge and wisdom in in fairy tales and in these stories um, you know ironically this is actually a major plot point in brave that the, the girl ends up Merida ends up discovering in the end that the the wisdom in in the the fairy the fairy tale that she learned as a child was the key to the you know the answer to her problems. Um, mm-hmm. So that's kind of ironic, <laughs> but uh, anyway, that yeah, that's sort of what what I think Disney has decided to do now. Um, I think the. I've never super been into Marvel, to be honest. I've been sort of, mm-hmm. I'm kind of repulsed by uh, the culture around it. Like there are a lot of um, sort of like very soy men who are like way, way, way too into it. You know what I mean? It's fine yeah. to like things. <laughs> Let people like things. There's, But there's sort of a line between enjoying things and making this like, brand into like your personal identity um do you know what i mean anyway 
No, I, I, I agree with you. I think, um, <laughs> I think I told you off air, like, I, I think I was on the verge of getting to that point because around like high school, college, it was, it was like super cool to be a Marvel fan. It was, it was kind of like, uh, it was like our generation's Star Wars because we didn't technically yeah. grow up with the original Star Wars. So it was a, a fan base that um, was on the cusp of something cinematically that was really uh, awesome to watch. But I, I think after Endgame uh, and <laughs> coincidentally after I met my my girlfriend who became my wife, I started to think like, um, you know, this is fun to like. I still like it. I still enjoy it. I'm still a nerd through and through, but it's it's time to grow up <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I do see a lot of yeah. um, I, I do see a lot of people online who yeah just continue to obsess over this stuff and make it their brand, especially now when Marvel is technically at its worst. And they still try to defend it and say like, oh, Marvel is forever. Marvel is always great. And it's like, guys, it's okay to say even yeah. some of the past movies aren't that great. I mean, I've I've kind of come back on some opinions where I used to say like every single movie is like a five-star hit, best movie of all time, Academy Awards, let's go. But looking back, there are some movies that I, I just look back and I say, I don't know why I praise that movie so much. It's not, it's okay. It's not that great. And then just, everything today from from like shang chi to she hulk to to captain marvel is honestly just like repulsive in in the idea of what uh specifically the the creators that they bring in to make these shows and movies what they think is heroic and what heroism is because it's just I, mean, I don't know if you ever saw or paid attention to she hulk uh it's supposed to be like the 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 feminist superhero show um, but it was just, I, I forced myself to watch every episode just to, just to see what the damage was. And I was repulsed the entire time. I don't know how I made it through. Yeah. Um, I was so offended by Captain Marvel. That was like the worst movie mm. I've ever seen. Really? Saw, what was the, um, sorry, what? Well, I'm, I'm curious. What, what was the most offensive part? I mean, there's a lot, but what was the most offensive part for you? Well, it's kind of just like the the apotheosis of like the the girl boss idiocy, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, this delusion that female physical strength could ever is ever a woman's strongest hand. No pun intended. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> they really. Same thing with, I guess, She-Hulk, although I've never seen that, but it looks completely stupid. Um, they, they're, they're, it's this insistence that, that the only kind of female strength or the, the, the most effective kind of female strength is her physical strength. It's like, this has never, ever, 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 ever been true throughout history. Um, and mm -hmm what are we doing we're just lying to everyone and it's a lie we just know it's a lie and so it's not a satisfying story because you know it's a lie yeah. um yeah it just it seems to sorry go ahead no no i that's basically it it's 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 just mm -hmm. it's a really ham-fisted um attempt to uh glorify women in these false terms that mm -hmm. really plays into i think a bigger political social cultural problem where women just don't know themselves and can't be honest with themselves and and men don't know or have no idea about women and or resentful of women like it, it yeah mm -hmm. anyway yeah no i think um a lot of mar modern marvel is is like yeah f females and women have physical strength that that like men don't have and yeah it is kind of false because like okay say you get mugged in the street in the middle of the night or whatever odds are a woman is not going to be able to you know kick that person's butt like captain marvel <laughs> for se. literally 10, <laughs> not to 10, say that 20. women can't yeah yeah not, yeah not to say that women can't defend themselves obviously there there are ways but like there there are just obvious like physical 
physical attributes that that both women make both women and men different that that it seems like marvel and, and even star wars want to um force onto people uh, I, I think yeah. star wars is almost just as bad if not worse than marvel yeah. um it, it's it's not just the, the fact that the franchise has become so um uh <laughs> franchised i guess for lack of a better word I, I i i used to enjoy getting a star wars movie once every two years and now we get a new show or a new movie every six months and it's the most annoying thing in the world like i just want to i like to enjoy my star wars in, in moderation you know or just anything in moderation um but i mean a lot of people say like this feminist stuff and I guess maybe we should hold on that. We'll get when we get to our main topic. But we kind of we started with Ariel, and we I think we got onto other things that actually made for an even more interesting conversation. But let's let's talk really quick about the the Ariel situation, then we'll get on to uh, girl boss and feminism in Hollywood. But um, so I don't know if you heard this, but uh, Disney announced that hot off the heels of of the Little Mermaid movie being a box office, not a box office. It's on the verge of becoming a box office failure. Basically uh, they are making a animated series that's inspired by that movie. And in that aerial is still black aerial. Uh, and it almost feels like it's a middle finger to its audience. Like if you didn't like this, well, screw you. We're going to double down because this is the new aerial. Yeah. Uh and I guess just in general, um, we've already kind of talked about race swapping and all that, but uh it's just that I think at this particular case is very interesting because you also have in Disney World and Disney Parks, you have two aerials walking around. You have Black Ariel walking around like in her human form, and then you have like mermaid Ariel in other parts of the but they're obviously like a black the, like the black version of Ariel and the original version of Ariel and mm. not only do I think that's like just horrible for Disney to do because it leads to brand confusion it's not a smart business move yeah but this is obviously something that is has not been embraced by the whole of society in fact you know despite the movie already making like half a half a billion dollars I think most people would say this is not wanted by the masses yeah and so i think this adds to a a, a a deeper a bigger question of um how do you f particularly feel about like disney ignoring the audience or specifically telling the audience what you want and what you originally liked is bad and you should be ashamed of yourselves mm. um hmm I think it's par for the course. I think that we've been sort of operating under the delusion in America that corporations are value neutral. Um, but you know what? The truth is they've always been, especially media corporations, um, they have always been propagating certain values. They've always been driving the culture. And mm -hmm. it, they've sort of, I think they've, they've, decided which way they're going to go and it's uncomfortable for people but unless but but that's just you know how, i don't know how do i feel about how do i feel about them giving people the middle finger i feel like it's just what they do so i don't have any feelings about it because i think that this is um something that's sort of built in um and i think that if there's anybody to be upset with, it's people who are upset and they think it's wrong and they keep consuming it. Mm -hmm. you know? It's kind of like, yeah. you don't get mad at a dog for being a dog, you know? Right. Like a dog, a dog is hungry and it gets crabby or something. It's like, well, that's a dog. <laughs> um, yeah. I think that's you exactly can... what happened with the, uh, um, that Velma show, uh, the Scooby Doo Velma show, it obviously it was a horrible woke mess. People hated it, but mm -hmm. apparently a lot of people like hate watched it, and that justified them getting a season two. 
and people are complaining. It's like, well, what do you expect? You watched, and I, I talked about this a couple episodes ago, like, if you watch this stuff, even to hate watch it, like, I, I used to, I actually used to be like, I used to enjoy watching things I knew were bad, but just like, I want to see how bad it is and make fun of it. But then you're also adding to the conversation and your, your uh, uh, support justifies uh, the continuing of, of this movement. And I think this yeah. year, you know, with beyond just the film industry, you're seeing boycotts of, uh, you know, Bud Light, uh, Target, Chick-fil-A. Yeah, and those are the most promising boycotts I think I've ever seen in my lifetime. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think, yeah, I think, I, I really think, as far as Bud Light goes, like it's a bridge too far. And they've, mm-hmm. they've their value has dropped 25% week after week since it happened. They were down, I think, even over Memorial Day, they've been like begging people to buy the beer, bringing the price yeah. down below market value, or I guess not market value, but below like what it, uh, the price. Like it, retail. Re, yeah, like the whatever the cost is to create it. Like they were bringing it below that cost. And, mm-hmm. uh, and they couldn't convince people to buy it beer so i I, i'm actually really impressed by that and i Mm -hmm. i deeply anticipate the day that disney experiences the same thing but for right now it's just people continue to find some kind of entertainment and continue Mm -hmm. to endorse it and hey like uh, here i am too talk i like I I have a I have one subscription and it's to Peacock so, so I can mm-hmm. watch uh we can watch The Office and 30 Rock but right, um right right you know I'm a hypocrite Yeah I mean, I I I think uh, I I always go by uh Matt Peterson's golden rule that you know boycotts never really work um and obviously this I think this is a um anomaly and I think it's society getting um getting fed up with just the nonsense. Um, and I yeah. think, I, I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with, um, I think it's impossible to boycott everything. Um, like I'll be honest with you. I have a subscription to Disney plus, but that's only because, uh, my sister and I agreed to keep it so that, uh, her daughter can watch bluey and, uh, <laughs> we, can, we, and so we can that's watch. A- yeah. That's fine. Yeah. She can watch Bluey. I can watch Indiana Jones. Uh, it, it works out. Right. But, um, but you're you're also a cultural commentator, and you kind of need to be aware of these things. So it's, right, I right, mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like, like I mean, it's, get it. Yeah, and I think sometimes it's also the, it, it's the numbers that people want to see. Like, oh, how many views did this thing get? I was like, oh, it's funny. People are paying for this, but they're not watching anything. So, um, yeah, mm-hmm. I don't. I think it's impossible to completely boycott everything. But I think there are certain things that are within our power as the audience, as the consumer as seen this year. And even last year, like uh, we talked about Lightyear, that movie made um, $50 million opening weekend. And that's a, that's a bomb that compared to other toy story films compared to other yeah. Pixar films. And, and it's, it's buzz Lightyear. Like that should be a billion dollar hit. No problem. And it, yeah, because of the the controversy surrounding the multiple controversies, but the most prominent one I think was just the gay kiss uh, included in that movie. I mean, that's the that's that was my black pill moment for me. <laughs> I had really? a, I had Did a long. Include... Wow, what's that? Do they actually include like that visual? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh my. Mm-hmm. And they just acted like it was a normal thing, and. Uh, I, I had a I had a friend of mine. Uh, she has a she has a, a I believe a five year old son, and she had to take her son out of the movie while it was after that happened to explain to him, like, look, there are people that are going to try to tell you, convince you that this is okay to be in children. This is okay to have in children's films, and it's not. Um, and you know, she's Catholic, so it it, it fits in the uh, obviously the. Uh, um, what we believe religiously, but even that is considered a uh, homophobic or whatever. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but yeah, the, the point being, um, you know, boycotts work and people, uh, more people need to realize that their, their voice matters. Their, where they put their money matters. And 
I know it's not possible to, uh, you know, like close yourself off completely from society and boycott every single thing, but, um, you know, do what you can and see what happens. And uh, obviously, I think I I don't think this is the end of of the boycott era as I'm as I'm dubbing it. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I also until like conservative creators and actually financiers decide to build an alternative system that is that has legitimately good entertainment which is something amanda mm -hmm. millias uh, talks about a lot and um yeah other people and then this sort of um you know right wing um and they're right about this it's like well there's no other option hollywood is a monopoly uh, in a right. certain sense, there are different production companies, but they're all on the same page. There's an ideological monopoly. Um, mm -hmm. and so, yeah. So, but they're also, I will, I will say, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful about that. I mean, because there are a lot of great, I, I, I believe that there are things sort of happening behind the scenes, uh, and a lot of really powerful actors, like, uh, Mark Wahlberg, Jim Caviezel, um, Matthew Morrison. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> who are, who are <laughs> trying to make things happen and, and, you know, and, and that's, that's encouraging too. So I think, I, I think that things are looking up. I really do. I, 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 I hate to sound too negative because I, um, I, I of course, like it's, it's, it's good and healthy to, to reject Hollywood but it's, it's mm -hmm. not all over, you know, I don't, I think that there's going to be a new age of, of media that is, um, that is more oriented toward the true, the good and the beautiful. And I look forward to that. Yeah, Enough people I completely are talking agree. about it. I, I feel like, yeah. Living that. yeah. I've always talked about like in the past two years, I, I've said like, you know, as things have gotten worse in, in society, like, the pendulum has to swing back the other way. And I've been waiting for the year to say, I think we're, I think this year is the beginning of the pendulum swinging in the opposite direction where we're going to see yeah. a yeah. lot of bad things in society actually go the, the opposite way because yeah, people are fed up and you're right. There are a lot of good people that you and I know and people we don't know even um, working on things that are going to, uh, you know, better society. And I, I too, uh, can't wait for, uh, for what comes of that. Totally. Totally. And also speaking about like the girl boss thing, mm -hmm. um, which is like, you know, that my pot uh, for, I feel like I should, this is actually something I should. Explain. Yeah. Let's, let's just get into, let's get into the main topic and, um, oh, sorry, yeah, right. talk, talk about that. Talk about the podcast and, uh, and yeah. all that. Okay. So my podcast, which I'm currently taking a bit of a break from, um, because uh we are redoing the house getting ready for baby number three um and also we've we've as vince knows and <laughs> without saying too much we've just had we're like moving companies and just like in between a lot of stuff it's chaotic but anyway i keep forgetting so i outed myself as the editor <laughs> yeah <laughs> Did, did you say that? Yeah. Anyway, Vince and, I, Vince and I are in constant communication here, but um, I forget what's been said and what hasn't. But um, mm -hmm. but anyway, so the the podcast and the, I realize now after a year of doing it that the title is confusing for people because they think it's like self referential, and I mm -hmm. understand how, why people would think that because in a certain sense that's right. I mean, and I I sort of subscribed to a certain um idea and model of success my whole life long, which, which was, which served me in many ways because I was able to accomplish, you know, a fair amount in my early twenties, um, before I sort of woke up to how, uh, sort of wrong headed and exhausting and, um, uh, illogical that, that life path and that model was ultimately. Um, but, Anyway, the title Girl Boss Interrupted, as we mentioned earlier, it comes from that movie Girl Interrupted, which tells the story of these uh, women who are in an insane asylum in like the American mid-century, and I think it's New England. And um, the, the reasons that the two main characters are there are because, you know, one of them is sort of 
on that path, that path that everybody is familiar with, the girl boss path, like her, her parents really want her to go to an Ivy. She's a talented writer, this and that, but she, she's just sort of overwhelmed and doesn't see herself in it. And she sort of mentally collapses. And then the other character is, um, you know, you could say, you could say uh, she's like an early example of like sex positivity. And so, and in, in, in my, in my view, these are sort of two sides of, of the coin that is the life script that is offered to young women in America today. It's like, you need to act like a man, act like you imagine a certain type of man, Don Draper <laughs> in your career <laughs> and in your bedroom. And this is the, this is the path to Nirvana essentially. And so the podcast is about deconstructing that trying to understand better ways of living, better ways of being a woman. What is a woman really is, is a question that I'm trying to answer. And Matt Walsh, you know, put out that great documentary in which the conclusion that he comes to is, you know, adult human female. I like, I actually tend to like Jordan Peterson's answer, which is marry one and find out. Um, <laughs> it, but it's, it's more, you know, womanhood is, is, there's a prof there's a profundity to the female experience that I think is totally stamped on and extinguished by the stories that the culture has been telling us about what it means to be a woman for many 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 years, and um, and this is really where the Hollywood thing sort of folds in uh, the 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 sort of the girl boss model the girl boss character the Mary Jane these archetypes that have been sort of thrust on girls um, and have ultimately, I think, really confused us. Um, that's, uh, yeah, that's something that, that, that my, my work is meant to deconstruct. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's awesome. Yeah. I mean, not just as the editor, but <laughs> as a audience member, um, I really enjoy your conversations because you do hit on a, a lot of, I mean, you have a lot of fun conversations about this stuff, but you also hit on like really hard topics that people, not enough people I think are willing to talk about uh, because they are, they are hard. I mean, like the la the latest episode, the last episode I think we did, um, or, or I'm sorry, I don't know if it's come out yet. The, the Stephanie Wynn episode, yeah. um, really hard stuff but really important stuff to talk to talk about at the same time well thanks vince yeah of course i still need to send you that audio intro <laughs> 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 we'll, we'll uh we'll 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 put these episodes out at the same time and we'll uh we'll support okay. each other <laughs> there we go. yeah yeah um so obviously it goes without saying that you're you're kind of an expert in this this field. You've been writing about it for a long time and and the podcast definitely acts as a uh as a resume of sorts I think in your expertise. Um so as far as yeah Hollywood um and feminism I think it goes without saying that it it's kind of um I don't want to go so far as to say ruined the film industry but I think it has um put a lot of false expectations on women and false ideas about feminism and what feminism even is. Um, what's your thoughts on all that? Yeah, this is a big question actually. And people in conservative world and Catholic world are really at arms when it comes to that term feminism. Um, I, I don't, here's the thing. I don't embrace it for myself because I think that the term is so contentious and the movement, well, first of all, it's not a, it's not a, a it's, it's sort of presented by its loudest, uh, loudest, um, advocates and adversaries as, a uh, hmm like a unipolar movement, you could say. But um, the history of feminism is very complicated. It's very much more complicated than people want to admit or believe. Um, so anyway, I, I'll, but I'll, what I'll talk about is, is the kind of feminism that we're most familiar with, 
which is that which is promoted by Hollywood and corporations and just the culture in general. Like what, what is the thing that's ascendant? It's the, 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 the form of feminism that I've been talking about, which is this sort of, um, it's a, it's a deeply anti woman, uh, philosophy because it imagines that women's greatest contributions or strengths can only arrive, um, or, or, can only be discovered or, or women are at their best when they're most like men. That's basically what, what the vibe is. Mm -hmm. So gosh, now I've forgotten your question. What was your question? Sorry. <laughs> uh, I, I guess, yeah, your thoughts on um, like feminism and how it pertains to um, Hollywood and like, I guess, I guess how Hollywood pre presents like a false idea of feminism and what it means to be a woman oh yes yes yeah so it's yeah it's hard to say i don't know if they present a false idea of feminism itself because they kind of uh, that's hard but they certainly present a false idea of what it means to be a woman um so mm -hmm. i guess we'll just like leave that the question of like what is feminism to <laughs> the side because that is something that really is like requires like a five mm -hmm. hour maybe i should do that because yeah, I really yeah. get in the middle of these fights and there are people who are like, you're a f like, there are so many people who hate me because I'm not a feminist and hate me because I mm. am one. It's like, I don't know mm. what to do here. <laughs> like, I don't know. Right. I love like people get really confused when you're somebody who talks about women's interests, who doesn't call himself a feminist because they think oh, well, you're, you're hiding something. You really are a feminist and you're just pretending to mm -hmm. be conservative or whatever. And then people yeah. on the other side are like, um, you know, just, just hate you because they think you want to drag them back to uh, a, a period of time when women were subjugated entirely, um, which is sort of questionable. You know, what period right. of time? I certainly don't want to go back to the 50s. Not that women were subjugated entirely in the 50s in the way that they mm -hmm. imagined. But but anyway, let's leave that question aside because it's kind of Yeah. Funny. Well, maybe maybe a better way to ask it without getting into a five-hour discussion is um, yeah. do, do you think that the um, – do you think the term feminism is hijacked? Or do you think um, – mm. do, do you think, that, like, the bad connotation feminism gets – is um is it warranted or do you think feminism is i guess more complicated than than what it is or what people say it is rather um i think most of the people who call themselves feminists have earned what disdain exists for them Mm. I but that being said, there are there are also people who call themselves feminists, pro life feminists, and maybe like historical feminists, people who really identify with with first waivers who uh, and who are who oppose these f disgusting things like sex positivity, and they're and are also skeptical of the culture of careerism mm -hmm. women who i am on the same page with for all of these things but they call themselves feminists and i don't i don't have a problem with these people you know like why i couldn't that would be utterly hypocritical just to to um you know they advocate for for a better life for women and and um a better lifestyle and a better cultural attitude toward women, they happen to call themselves feminists. Well, they, they aren't the kind of feminists that we're, we all want, imagine in our heads when we think about that. But so, mm -hmm. yeah, that, you see what I'm saying? That, I don't know, some, some people who call themselves feminists really earn, earn the hate. And then others yeah. are trying to be precise and coming up against just a whole lot of confusion and anger and I don't know what to say. I don't know. It's mm -hmm. really hard. I, I like yeah. I, said, I don't call myself a feminist, but 
I agree with, uh, I agree with many of the women who were the proto-feminists in America. Like the I, and this is this is actually the peak of irony, is that the modern modern conservatives want to sort of resurrect these this ideal of Republican motherhood, and little r Republican motherhood. We're talking. Uh, the idea that a virtuous republic requires virtuous people and mothers are the people who cultivate virtue in future citizens, i.e. children. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, So Republican motherhood was this sort of colonial ideal and It'd be revolutionary, really, it, era. It, Abigail Adams was a proponent of Republican motherhood. This is John Adams' wife, right? And this is the ideal that, like, mo- that modern Republicans, big R Republicans, maybe not Republicans, but conservatives, traditional conservatives, want to resurrect. But at its time, it was a feminist idea, or it, mm-hmm. at the very least, a proto feminist idea, because it, Abigail Adams and her peers, recognized that uh, women's education did matter in this in this way in order to to make society run properly and and not just women's education but women's dignity and their behavior and their virtue and um, so do you see what I'm saying it's become very complicated so now the ideal of like Republican motherhood would be mm. anti-feminist according to like the liberal feminist sort of Borg, right? Because they think that woman or motherhood is not empowering for women and women don't like, we're all radical individualists who don't have any real responsibilities to one another. The concept of like an interdependent home and an interdependent society actually is kind of completely foreign to them so um yeah (laughs) i could go on and on this is getting really dry though i i I think we i think we just uh uh discovered the sequel to what is a woman what is feminism (laughs) yeah no that's so true that is so true it's really complicated Mm. and i once called myself so I don't call myself a feminist, but I did once call mm-hmm. myself an anti-feminist, but I don't think I can say that anymore because I, I struggle so much with that term. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I, mean, I, I think, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I just, I, I want to acknowledge really quickly that feminism as we understand it now is downstream of communism. And so those are basically the two strains. There's like a version mm-hmm. of feminism, which is just a pro woman sort of you know advocating for the legitimate rights and 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 virtuous uh education in virtue for women okay so that that mm-hmm. that's like maybe a proto feminism um and 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 it was a response to certain industrial era developments that had been particularly hard on women and and genuinely degrading um mm-hmm. And that, if if people want to call that feminism, of course, that's, I agree with them. I do. I do. Uh, I think that there's, I think that the interests of the family and the woman as the heart of the home have to be defended. And if men aren't going to do it, you know, it's it's perfectly licit for women to defend themselves against the ravages of the market and against you know, crumbling sexual mores. If that's mm-hmm. feminism, okay, call me a feminist, you know? But, um, <laughs> yeah. But then in, in the, in the communist and post communist era, it took on a totally different meaning. Mm-hmm. I see. Yeah. I, I, you, you wouldn't think it'd be a, such a complicated thing because, you know, in the same way that masculinity is a, is a natural attribute of, of manhood you would think femininity is a natural attribute of, of um, womanhood. But um, obviously, I mean, especially in a society where we're asking ourselves, what is a woman? Um, it's a, I, I didn't even realize, I, actually, that was very insightful. It's a more complicated answer than even I once thought. And um, 
yeah, I think that definitely warrants uh, a little more um, research and uh, open discussion on um, maybe not what feminism is today, but what feminism should be. Yeah. And if we want to, I mean, there's, there's a genuine sort of debate to be had about whether you abandon the term or not. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it, it might be time to abandon the term. But the sad part <laughs> in all of this is that people who are socially conservative um, abandoned anything relating to women to the other side. Mm. Uh, they, they just, the, I think it, it was, it's a combination of just making themselves a sort of exclusively a, a party about exclusively economic interests or whatever. But even so, conservatives have avoided talking about women's issues for so long that the left has been able to own women's issues. And the left yeah. has really branded themselves the party of women. And so that's, the, that's just the default position for most people now. And they do have a more robust discourse, you could say. Um, a lot of women feel, feel ignored and overlooked um, in conservative politics because, you know, conservatives tend to want to talk about like the structures of, uh, of, of, uh, you know, an ideal government and these sort of abstractions. Um, so there's really room to talk about, uh, to talk about women's interests, uh, in a, in a traditional, well, women's real interests, I'll just say. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think that conservative social conservatives needed to, to to reclaim women's interests and yeah. start to be honest about them. And if you and I think when you are truthful and honest, and not just truthful on and honest, but but um, that it, if you love women, that will come through, and people will want to be on your side. Yeah. Um, a lot of people. There are a lot of women who. Because especially recently with the trans issue, they correctly perceive that the left hates women. So despite being the, the side of the political equation in this country that has, has claimed women for their own, um, there, there's a real hatred there. I mean, transgenderism is nothing short of hatred of women. Uh, oh, and, yeah. And, and it's different, you know, you know, expression, but that's what it is. And so I think a lot of women intuit that, but, and are kind of looking for a new political home, but there's not so much for them on the other side. So they feel a little bit, uh, a little bit, you know, floating in the wind, trying to figure their politics out. Mm -hmm. That's, that's why I think it's yeah. important to talk about these things, but. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, getting, <laughs> Getting back to um, the the <laughs> film and culture and movies and stuff like that. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I actually, I that was a very that was very educational for me as well as someone who's not an expert on these things. So I do appreciate that. Um, it's a great <laughs> conversation. Um, I'm curious though. Uh, we did talk a little bit about uh, Marvel and Star Wars and some of the, some of the main uh, instigators of modern feminism and film. Uh, what are some of the biggest offenses that you've seen that you've paid the most attention to? Ooh. You mean the, the biggest offense? Is, sorry, could you rephrase the question for me? Yeah, like, uh, like what movies or shows that have come out in the past couple of years have you seen, or even not seen, just heard about in general that you think are the, that have got us to this point where in like modern feminism in movies and television? Oh yeah. Okay. Um, no, I really feel like I, I, I would just reiterate Captain Marvel, like mm -hmm. very much the worst movie I've ever seen. Um, it's almost like the gold standard at this point. <laughs> yeah, it, it really is. Um, but you know what? I, I oh, They've kind of shot their, themselves in the foot a little bit because it's becoming cringe. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, especially for young guys, they can just see through this crap. It's, they're not fooling anyone, you know? Yeah. Not anyone. 
at mm-hmm. least in the 90s the stuff was more subtle but they've right, lost it right right <laughs> yeah it, it's it's interesting how um i feel like women in hollywood in general have always been there's always been like a struggle to find uh representation or to get more representation or tell more truthful female stories about women um in a time in times where you know i think feel like i don't know in in pop culture you can point to a lot of great female characters existing before we we were in this this uh hyper focused era um a lot of people point to linda hamilton in, in terminator um uh, Sigourney Weaver in the Alien movies. Uh, like these mm-hmm. are characters who, um, uh, oh, this YouTube channel, uh, I believe its name is uh, Baggage Claim. Um, I was watching a couple of videos on her channel about feminism, really good stuff. But she was saying how these characters, or even Mulan from Disney, um, these characters don't need to like wear their wear their struggles on their shoulder as like as like oppressed women they they are you know some of those some of those movies are about women trying to excel in a male dominated space but it's their inherent it's it's their inherent skills and 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 abilities that are god given that make them great it's not like i'm a woman and and, and being a woman is like a like a superpower that that I channel that no one can stop me, you know, where, yeah. which is where we're at today. Yeah. I think that there has been a real, I think the thing that makes it different is the victimhood mentality. And it's a mm-hmm. very indulgent perspective. It's both indulgent and delusional. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you, you think, uh, pick it up. BC. Do you, Sorry. That's okay. Do you think the, the like time's up me too movement, um, accelerated this in any way or has anything to do with this not even just in hollywood but just in general this yeah um this again this you know era what? of feminism I'm gonna, that we're I'm gonna in be really clinical for just a second about the me too movement i think that that was the way that gen x uh mostly gen x actresses um Uh, made it more difficult for young new women to get in the business. Mm. Uh, I think that is the most cynical possible interpretation. So forgive me, but um, but I think that that was a factor. Not for everyone, not for mm-hmm. everyone. But you gotta wonder why there seems to be no fresh faces in Hollywood anymore, especially for women. I think production yeah. companies are afraid of them. They're afraid of women. And I think mm-hmm. that people like Jennifer Aniston and these sort of aging women, and there's nothing wrong with aging, you know, I, it's actually, there, there's, there are good things to be said for like casting women in their own age bracket. I mean, goodness, great. I love that. Mm-hmm. That's great. But I do right. think that, that there, there, there might've been an element of that in there because it really did, I think, make it harder for younger women to break into the business. Yeah. Yeah. That's my I, hot take I, for the day. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I think it's um it's interesting, not only that, but the way Hollywood as a whole reacted to it. Because like the Harvey Weinstein thing was obviously the the, the inciting incident of that whole thing. And it was like an open secret. And now they're coming out with movies where people in Hollywood were trying to expose this, but they couldn't because Harvey Weinstein was just so powerful. And I'm over here thinking, you, you hypocrite. You remember that movie that came out, she said, where it was really about like these two female reporters trying to expose Harvey Weinstein, but mm. no one was willing to come out. It's like, th- there are so many actresses who have consented to whatever happened behind closed doors and who have careers because of Harvey Weinstein and, and got up on stage to thank him. And I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, trying to, to um, uh, diminish those who are genuine victims, but um, I don't know. Part of me just thinks like it, it was very easy for, if, if a lot of people spoke up sooner, I don't think we would have been in this boat. And a lot of people, I think abuse the me too movement to 
as you say, like, you know, maintain a certain status or get things without actually working for them. Mm -hmm. But then again, the, I think the solution is just to abandon Hollywood because it's exactly. a cesspool of sin. <laughs> exactly. So, um, one last question before we wrap things up, uh, obviously on this show, we like to talk about not just the problems, but also the solutions, if there are any. Um, so as far as, yeah, as far as, uh, feminism in Hollywood goes, uh, do you think, do you think there is a solution to this problem? And if so, what do you think those solutions are? Um, yeah, I think that people need to tell better stories. I think people who are fundamentally committed to truth, beauty, and goodness need to fund and create good stories. That's it. That's what speaks to people. That's what mm -hmm. is going to succeed. And I think that, that when you produce something that's real and that's, that's really accessing that sort of, you know, inexplicable reality that, and, and pathos, um, you're going to succeed. It just gets it, success speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. I, that's yeah. great. I think that's great advice. Um, yeah, we, I think we also need just better people telling these stories. Um, Mm -hmm. I say all the time, we don't have filmmakers in Hollywood, we don't have storytellers in Hollywood anymore. We have uh, activists posing as filmmakers who want to see their, um, their, their fetishes justified on screen. And also they want to see themselves represented in, in the way that they see as the most pure, uh, incorruptible versions of themselves. And, um, Really, it's a, it's like a it's, it's an insight into these the souls of these people, and it's not good, true, and beautiful as you say. It's um, you know the souls of these people are really uh, depraved and um, Dark, yeah. uh, selfish uh, mm -hmm. in a lot of really disgusting ways. That isn't good for society. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I never thought it'd be such a simple solution, but yeah, we need better storytellers. We need better stories and. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think they're coming. I think we have to wait a little longer, but I, I, I do think they're coming. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I will, we'll have our generations, Frank Capra. We will. I Yes, yes. More gingers in film. <laughs> Was he a ginger? <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm just saying more gingers in film in general. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. This one, she'll be a movie star someday. Just kidding. Yeah. I, really, I really hope not. <laughs> Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Well, if she ever wants to, we'll make a better Hollywood or just a better film industry for people, for younger people to come in and, and actually be supported in a way. Because, I mean, I come from I come from a university where our mission statement was to impact culture for Christ. And a lot of people didn't really take that that mission to heart. Um, and understandably so. It can be kind of a cringy uh, mission statement when you think about it. But I did. And I still think it's an important thing. Like I believe as, as a, as a uh, podcaster, as a filmmaker, as a storyteller, it is my mission on this earth to impact culture for Christ in a positive way and tell that. stories. Thank you. Thank you. I, I believe it's, it's important for us to tell stories for uh, our children and our gen our younger generations to, um, you know, we need, we need to give our kids, you know, their star Wars their Avengers, uh, their Indiana Jones, like the, the, the films and the characters that inspired us to be the best versions of the, ourselves, the people who inspire uh, people to, to go off and do great things and, and be heroic in their own um, simple mundane lives. Uh, we need those stories and, uh, um, the, you know, they're, they're important. And, and uh, especially now being a father, I think it's even more important uh, to me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Great. I've got. I mean, well, if she watches anything. It's like stuff that I watched when I was a kid. None of that's the great. Stuff yeah. Close yeah, to and it. I think that's I think that's the best way to to raise our kids on on media. I mean, right now, my wife and I have vowed to like not show our children like TV or anything for the first year, yeah. and just try to get them stimulated without 
watching no, TV. No, that's, that's smart. I would avoid it for the first year. I, I would. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Uh, obviously then after that, yeah, I, I can't wait to show uh, my kids everything that I grew up on and, and uh, keep them away from all the depraved, disgusting stuff that is being made today. For sure. Except for your Top Guns, of course. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Helen, thank you so much for being on the show. It's been it's been an honor having you. It's been a really fun, insightful, and uh, uh, depthful discussion. And I really really appreciate you taking the time. Oh, thanks, fans. I hope you don't get canceled for this one. Uh, I, I got Rumble, so I'm I'm covered. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's like YouTube insurance. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> um. Is there anywhere pe- you want people to follow you online, uh, follow what you're doing and stuff? I'm just taking in everything, a break from everything but Twitter at the moment. But I'll be okay. back to Instagram and and, and uh, YouTube and all that soon. Just um, not now. So you can follow me on Twitter. Understandable. Yeah. I deleted my Instagram like a couple of weeks ago because I was just what like uh, too much. I don't know. After a while, you, you just you can get on like a a binge with social media and it's like yeah. i watch i just want to reconnect with the world again and and live in reality as opposed to uh the yeah. digital landscape <laughs> you did you took the headphones off <laughs> let's put them back on <laughs> absolutely destroyed mm. <laughs> uh well i will link um your podcast and your socials in the description of this episode as for me, guys, you can always follow me on uh, Twitter at the TheBigBoo75 and Instagram at OfficialVinceSalerno and, of course, this YouTube channel. And subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, wherever you listen. Um, and we will see you guys next time for another episode of the Vince Salerno Podcast. Thanks for watching and listening. God bless and peace out. Bye, Vince. Bye, Vince.